Good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? And um, I welcome you to uh, this morning's study. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we have to study once again this morning. We are thankful, Lord, for the work that your Holy Spirit is doing upon our hearts and in our lives. On those in the movement, we just pray, Lord, that um, as we open your word together, that your Holy Spirit will unite us with you and with one another. We ask for forgiveness for our sins, for our, our thoughts about others. Help us, Lord, to recognize our own sin and to trust fully in you. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so we have... Um, sorry, dear, we already started. So we have in this study, um, we're going to be looking at the enemies of, of that are hindering the building of the temple. And here we just have this line. This is obviously a just a chronology of the, the reigns of Cyrus, uh, Cambyses, False Myrtus, and Darius, right? So this is those that are going to oppose the temple. So this is the period from when the foundation of the temple is laid. Well, technically, it's from the fall of Babylon to when uh, they have the Passover the first Passover in the second temple. So we're going to go through this history. We've covered the first part, of course. So we know the fall of Babylon when that occurred, October 13th, 539 BC. And within about two years of the fall of Babylon, we have the accession of Cyrus to the throne. I'm going to clear that that's within about two years from the fall of Babylon. And then we have Cyrus's decree, which we're placing as um, the 24th day of the first month on the biblical calendar. Um, and then we have uh, the altar. So this is here. And that's in chapter three, verse one and verse six. So they arrive at Jerusalem after the decree. They're then going to set up this altar in the seventh month on the first day of the seventh month. And then they lay the foundation of the temple on the second day, second month, the second year. Doesn't tell us which day. We assume probably on the first day of the second month. In Solomon's temple, it's going to be the second day of the second month that they lay the foundation, begin to lay the foundation. Now, then we have the death of Cyrus. Now, I don't know how much detail people would like to go through here. I mean, I've gone through the ancient documents and where we can see. Uh, where Cyrus died. So whether that's really important here at this point, maybe not at this point of the study. Um, but we know that Cambyses then is going to reign after the death of Cyrus. And we're going to show that he's referred to as Ahasuerus in Ezra chapter 4. And then uh, we have false Smyrtus, his revolt, the death of Cambyses, or Cambyses, and um, that's going to be a reign of seven months. That false Myrtus is um, going to be the king of Persia, right? And, and also the king of Babylon. And then we have Darius's reign. And then we're going to have, we're going to look at some things here in dealing with Darius's reign as we go through. So we're going to be going through this whole history. Now, uh, we're first going to look at a statement. This is uh, a manuscript. It's manuscript uh, 116 from 1897, uh, and it's from October 3rd, 1897. So this is Spirit of Prophecy. So it's, it's uh, entitled, The Building of the Lord's House. Ellen White says, my attention has been called to the last books of the Old Testament. I was directed to bid the people of God take heed how they hear and what they do. 
These scriptures make special reference to the last days when Bible history will be unfolded. So Ellen White is plainly telling us that this these scriptures that deal with the last books of the Old Testament. So these are going to be Haggai, Zechariah. Um, these are some of the last books. We're studying those on Sabbath morning. Um, that uh, they make spe special reference to the last days when Bible history will be unfolded. So Ellen White is clear that in the last days, Bible history will be unfolded. Where do we see Bible history being unfolded? Is this happening within Adventism, within the church? Is this happening where? Right before our eyes. Yeah. So this is happening within this movement. I can think of no other place where Bible history is being unfolded. Right? That's this movement. <clears throat> yeah, I don't see it in the mainline. Yeah, I don't. I don't see it in the mainline church. No, and and I don't see it really anywhere that anybody is doing the type of work that we're doing. So this is something that's unique to this movement, and specifically unique to the studies that we have been doing. Right, but it, but it began in this movement, and so we're continuing that work. There are brought to our notice those who are not walking in the way of the Lord, but are following deceptive leadings. From the word, we are to learn the will of God for the guidance of our own course in these last days. Let your minds take in the subject, read and consider and be instructed. So now when it comes to whoever that is that are following deceptive leadings, that are not walking in the way of the Lord. Um, you know, we could let our imaginations run, you know, of who that is. But but the point that we need to focus upon is not who who is being deceived. We just need to not be deceived ourselves, right? So that is to be our focus. But we need to understand this history and that this history will reprove us, right? Because... That's what the Bible is for, is to reprove us. So if we study these things, we should be able to receive reproof. And so that means we need to read and consider and be instructed. So that's three steps there. Light was given me in regard to this time. Reproof came because places of worship had been accepted that discredited our work in the place of magnified it so i'm not sure what she means here places of worship had been accepted that discredited our work i'm not sure specifically what she is referring to um, the lord has resources his hand is on the machinery when the time came for his temple to be rebuilt he moved upon cyrus as his agent to discern the prophecies concerning himself and to grant the Jewish people their liberty and more. Cyrus furnished, Cyrus furnished them the necessary facilities for rebuilding the temple of the Lord. This work began under Cyrus and his successor carried on the work begun. So that would be Cambyses, right? Thus saith the Lord, his redeemer or thy redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. The Samaritans tried to hinder this work by their false reports, they arouse suspicion in minds easily stirred up to suspect. And because of this discouragement, the Jews became unbelieving and indifferent in regard to the work that the Lord had signified he would have done. They were opposed by Smyrtus the usurper, then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So we're going to address those verses again. 
But you can see that this is what she's talking about. Um, the opposition that happened um, in regard to uh, the building of the temple. So we'll look at those verses. When Darius came to the throne, he set aside the work and prohibition of the usurper. But even then, the people that should have been most interested continued to be indifferent. They misapplied the prophecy given by inspiration. They misinterpreted the word of God and declared that the time to build had not yet come, and that until the days were fully accomplished, they would not undertake the work. But while they left the building of the house of the Lord, the temple in which they could worship God, until the end of the time specified, as the captivity of the Jews had fully come, they built mansions for themselves. So what is she saying here? What What is this, when Darius comes to the throne, we know that he set aside the work and prohibition of the usurper. So that's false murders and stopped the temple from being rebuilt. So, so Darius is not opposing the Jews. But are they interested in building the house of God? No. Okay. So why not? What's going on here? They let self enter in rather than doing the work that they were supposed to do. Okay. So, I mean, we have to apply this to our time. Now, normally when we look at these lines, so if, if we look at, and we haven't drawn out a line, which is one thing that we're still going to do. But when we look at, at the lines, we know that we have the first, second, and third decree, right? Now, this is talking about the time of really the first decree, right? So, you know, when I draw this out on a line, which I have done, I've drawn these three decrees out on a line, you're going to have the first message arrive at the time of the end. And, and in this history, there are two dates that mark the time of the end, the fall of Babylon and Cyrus uh, succeed, succeeding to the throne. So the accession, accession of Cyrus, accession of Cyrus. And um, that would parallel in 1798 with uh, the Pope being taken captive on February 15th, 1798, and his death on August 29th, uh, 1799. So those two events are connected. They, they both mark the time of the end. And we have that in our history. We have November 9th, 1989, and December 25th, uh, 1991, right? So we have these events. And we have, um, in this history, we have two people. We have Darius, um, and we have uh, Cyrus. In, in our history, we have um, Reagan and Bush the first. Now, what about in 1798? How would we how would we see the parallel there in 1798? Because the fall the fall of uh, the papacy is the result of um, General Berthier coming in and and taking the Pope captive. So would we just put um, Napoleon there as the other, or how would we look at that history? If you understand what I'm asking about 1798, how does it parallel 539 and 537 and 1989, and 1991? How would this with Napoleon factor into this history? Since he is technically representing the King of the South. Right. But you have General Berthier, who's the. Um, so these are the powers that take down a Babylon. Right. OK. And we have the same in our history. We have the power that takes down the Soviet Union. Right. It's going to take down the king of the stuff, the king of the. So. So the king of the north, it's going to be the papacy in the United States that take down the king of the south in our history. I'm, I'm just wondering how we look at that in 1798, because there are two. Two that are, are there. But I, I don't know if we have to make a parallel. I'm just asking, do we? Is there something that we that we can do in that history? 
or is it slightly different? Does it have to be identical is what I'm asking. It doesn't seem to be as obvious. Okay. In that history. I think Napoleon, although he would be the main general, I still mm -hmm. he wasn't the he wasn't the emperor at that time. Yeah, I know. So he he may have been under the actual Senate or whatever it was in Paris at that their yeah. time. So even he even though he was maybe the general, he wasn't really the sort of exalted over the, the whole nation of France. I I I think rather what you're talking about is the directorate. Because I think they had abolished everything else, and there was only the directorate at that time that was ruling over France. Yes. So, so I'm not sure how we would make that parallel. Um, now, now, when does uh, Napoleon attack Egypt? 1798. So it's in 1798 he attacks Egypt? Yes. Okay. Now, so to some degree, I mean, we can see that uh, Napoleon is, like France, is the king of the south, right? It's called Sodom and Egypt. And the main characteristics we look at, at there are its, its atheism and um, its licentiousness, right? That's how we look at, you know, Sodom is being licentiousness, Egypt is being atheism. You know, who is the Lord that I may, whatever, you know, the words of, of Pharaoh. So, um, but Napoleon also does conquer the South. He does conquer Egypt. It does become his territory, right? Now, how did the pioneers look at that history? How did they look at Daniel 11, verse 40? Well, France was the king of the south, and Turkey was the king of the north. Uh, the, the pioneers? Josiah had, Litch. Josiah Litch, right? Mm -hmm. Josiah Litch. He followed the understanding of Alexander Keith. And and we have the same view uh, by uh, Smith. Uriah Smith held the same view. So the view that they had when we looked at it, they had uh, the king of the south was Egypt, the king of the north was Turkey, and France was neither the king of the north nor the king of the south. It was the third power, right? So they had France coming against Egypt, and then uh, Syria or Turkey coming against France, right? That's how they interpreted that history, correct? Yes. Okay, so so France wasn't the king of the South, but, but France did conquer Egypt. So even if you went by their, their logic that the territory occupied made, um, made that power then uh, uh, made that power become that uh, that symbol, right? So when France conquered Egypt, it then becomes the king of the south. Um, you know they they could have followed that logic. they they did they were inconsistent in how they did that, right? So when Uriah Smith is looking at it later, he's taking what Lich had taught, what the pioneers had taught. And then he starts making some predictions about what's going to happen in their history, which, of course, completely fail because he's looking at the king of the north being being Turkey, the king of the south being Egypt. So so he's looking at, you know, the sick man of the east, this whole thing with with uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire and making predictions about it, which none of them come to pass. Now, there are still people in in that, that are slightly connected with this movement. That is people who still have the charts behind them when they make videos, um, though they use the corrupted charts of Rich, uh, Rich's charts that he made. 
Um, they usually use those, not the original charts, which I think is kind of telling that they choose to use uh, not the original charts. Um, but anyway, th this group teaches that Uriah Smith was correct, right? So I, I think some of you are familiar with, with those teachings within what we might call present truth. Uh, people who have been connected at some time with this uh, with this message. So what's the problem? So how do we address this problem? Um, that the pioneers actually did not understand Daniel chapter 11. So they're going to take from Daniel 11 verse 36. Now we're going to get into that in more detail um, as time goes on. But why did the pioneers get that wrong? So they're going to look at verse 36 and the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself. They're going to take this as being France, not the papacy. How does that relate to the present? They were making a literal application rather than the spiritual. Okay. And so they needed, they did, they ignored the idea that before the cross, literal, after the cross, spiritual. And one of the things we'll see in Daniel chapter 11 is that when we look at Daniel 11, it's dealing with what powers, what, what is its, what is the scope of its study? What, what is it looking at? What's the purpose of Daniel 11? Generally, it's relating to the history of Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Okay, so so what is that? Well, that's the kingdom kingdoms of Bible prophecy. Okay, but but it's first going to address the desolating powers. First, paganism, right? Right. Yeah. This is okay. And then papalism. And it's going to show the transition, right? Because that's what you're going to get in Daniel 11, verse uh, 31. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. And we say, well, this is going to be this period from 508 to 538, right? Yes. Okay. And that period is a parallel to the 30 years of Christ that precedes his baptism, that precedes that 70th week. So in a sense, the cross for the two desolating powers is in 538. That is, we line up 538 with the cross in the week of Christ study. Right? Yeah. yeah. Now, some people don't quite understand this. That is, uh, they wonder why does the week of Christ, you know, have this, the cross in the center? But we know that there's his earthly ministry and his heavenly ministry for, for the, the covenant week. And the counterfeit covenant is the two 1260s that make up the 2520 of northern Israel. Right. That's the counterfeit covenant week. Now, the 30 years isn't at the beginning of that week. It's it's going to be in the center, where in the week of Christ, the 30 years is at the beginning of that week. And so some people say, well, how does that parallel? But what we can say is that paganism is earthly counterfeit and papalism is a heavenly counterfeit because paganism has animal sacrifices and papalism doesn't, right? But they are still really the same satanic false worship. Just, we know that the papacy is clothed in Christian garb, right? So it's paganism dressed up. That's what papalism is. So if that's the case, if we're in Daniel chapter 11, that means we now have to look at this is after the cross that is, Prior to 538, 
we are looking at these powers, the North and the South, as the literal territories. Turkey and Egypt, right? The Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic Empire. But after 538, we now move to spiritual. So this power that arises in this period of time, this is papal Rome. This is the abomination that make it desolate. This is a spiritual power, not a literal power. And so you can't take this and apply it now to the territories, the territories, the literal territories, after 538, right? Even though France does conquer Egypt, and we could say in some ways, you know, France then becomes the king of the South because it conquers Egypt. But the reason why France is the king of the South is because its characteristics, its licentiousness, and its atheism, right? Now, of course, France isn't atheistic at the start. So it's it's going to become atheistic later. France is going to put the papacy on the throne of the earth in 538. And France is going to take the papacy off the throne of the earth in 1798. So it becomes Sodom and Egypt. Now, the papacy itself is then taking on this characteristics of the king of the north, because Rome conquers the north, right? Rome ends up occupying that territory of the king of the north, right? That's, that's what happens historically. So we know that uh, in Greece, what ends up happening is that Greece... It's going to be the, the Seleucid Empire that's going to, to overcome, right, and conquer the South. But Rome comes in and Rome conquers the North, and it then becomes the king of the North prior to 538. Does, does that make sense to people? I mean, we're going to go through this when we go through the rest of D Daniel chapter 11. <laughs> Well, Rome eventually took the south as well. Yes, it does eventually take the south as well. But it first takes the north, right? Yes. And, and the north has already conquered the south when Rome comes in. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that. but Because when does, when does the northern kingdom, when does the Seleucid Empire con conquer Egypt? What, what's what's the, the marker? In, the, in Daniel chapter 11. Isn't it the battle of Panium? How would the battle of Panium be, be a marker of the, uh, no, Seleucid Empire, yeah. Yeah, that would work. Right, because we have the Battle of Raphia, Battle of Raphia, that's going to be the king of the south conquering the king of the north, right? Okay, yes. And then we have the Battle of Paneum, the king of the north is then going to come back and conquer the king of the south. This was this whole premise back in uh, 2000 and, uh, well, it would be 2016, in December of 2016, when we had... Um, Chawa to, you know, present to Jeff about the Battle of Raphia, right? And then Jeff, you know, looks at Raphia and Paneum. And I know that Paneum was introduced before too. But he then sees this parallel to what happened in uh, 1798 and 1989. You can see, okay, this is actually, this history being pre-repeated, if that makes sense. That is, they become typical of what's going to happen later. And we can then look at that history and apply it to our history. And so we see that even though we had uh, Daniel 11 verse 40a fulfilled in 1798 and Daniel 11 verse 40b 
fulfilled in 1989. But this again repeats, but on a different level, right? And, and so at that time, we didn't understand enough about the lines to understand what that meant. So obviously, initially, the idea was this is going to be a battle between uh, Russia and the United States, right? Um, now, have we completely abandoned that view that, that Russia and the United States are, are to be, uh, that that's what Rafi and Paniam are about? I don't think we've completely abandoned that view. Yeah, well, I don't think we've abandoned it, but I don't think we know what to do with it yet, <clears throat> right? So we have moved it over into the realm of the globalists. So my understanding is that we were looking for Russia to be that power, but but the head and the head, the idea of the head, well, it was, you know, Moscow. So this is what Jeff was teaching. He's saying basically Moscow survived. And so that is still the king of the South. So even though the Soviet Union was destroyed, the king of the South still is there in Moscow. So that's Russia. And since the United States was the army of the king of the North, the papacy, the United States is the king of the North. And so there would be this battle between the king of the South and the king of the North. But we came to realize that the head there wasn't Russia, that the head there was globalism, right? That is, this is this spiritualistic power that then conquered the United States, right? So this, and, and we could even bring it into the realm of Republicans and Democrats within the United States. That is, we can go back to the Civil War where we had the Democrats were the king of the South and the Republicans were the king of the North, right? So you had the North and the South. We could even look at, at the history in 742 BC dealing with Northern Israel and Judah, right? So we know that there is parallels there. We haven't sorted them all out yet, right? So, so, so this is something that we still need to, to try to sort out. How do we understand that? Is this just something within a line that's zoomed into and we see this in our history, but it still relates to something future? And, and what does that look like? We, we haven't sorted that out yet. But we do know when, and I got here, Daniel 11. So the king of the south shall be moved with collar and shall come forth to fight with him. So that's going to be Raphia, right? This is talking about the battle of Raphia, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up. So that's the king of the south's heart. And he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. So this is the persecution that happens at that time. For the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and much riches. Right. So this is then the, the defeat of the king of the south. So this is the battle of Paneum. And in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the robbers of, the, of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. So that's Rome, but they shall fall. But Rome now comes in here, right? And so then it comes into this history, but so the king of the north shall come and cast of a mount, right? So we're not going to go through this whole study right now. But the point is when we finally get through that history of what happened with uh, pagan Rome and how it became the king of the north, how it's going to then conquer Syria, then we're going to have um, in 11 verse 31, we're going to have the transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome. And then um, it's going to describe that history of how that occurs. And then it says, and the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself we know that that's the papacy. It's not France at the end of, at, in 1798. Because the characteristics here are the same characteristics in Daniel chapter 7 and in other places, 2 Thessalonians. 
So we know that this power is not an atheistic power in the sense of like what we see with the globalists, but this power is is um, is a self exaltatory power, right? It's the it's the papacy, it's the man of sin, the son of perdition who opposeth and and exalteth him above all things that are called God or that can be worshipped, right? So that's what Daniel 11, verse 36 is. Now, Uriah Smith, the pioneers, Josiah Litch, Alexander Keith, they say the king here is France, right? Well, it's Napoleon or whatever you want to say that it's going to be. So, so they're, they're going to have this as atheistic France, right? And they take these things, you know, he shall not regard the God of his fathers and all those types of things. But we know that this refers to the papacy, not to France. And so at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him. This is the king of the north. The king of the north is not France, which is how the pioneers and Uriah Smith looked at this. Uh, the, when the king of the south pushes at him, the king of the north, um, it's where they just have its pushing at France. And then the king of the north, that's going to be Turkey in the pioneer's view, shall come against him like a whirlwind against France. They're going to take that history in 1790 and onward. But we know that this is referring to uh, France pushing against the papacy and then the papacy pushing back in 1989, right? So that's our understanding of these things. <clears throat> So there's a little bit of a di diversion there, but, um, and, and the question centered around, oops, should be here in Ezra, just hang on. So when we look at this time of the end, because we're looking at 1798, we're looking at 539 to 537, to 536, and then we look at 1989. We know that when we create these on the lines, that there is this, um, this opposition, right? And so what was my original question? I'm trying to remember what I asked and why we went off in that diversion. It, it had to do with um, um, the, this work of the enemies. So the work of the enemies within this movement can we say, can when, when we put this on the line, we can look at what happened, you know, in the early history of this movement. But can we take this whole story and place it right now? That there is this work of the enemies going on within this movement at the present time. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Because we know that we are supposed to be building this temple. What is the temple that we're building? Because we've talked about that in this movement for a long time. Are we not building the living temple? Okay, so we're building a church, right? Because the temple refers to a church. Um, but in this context, we know that this is about a message as well, right? Correct. Okay, so there's a message that needs to be given. And this structure that, that needs to be built, there's a foundation. Because when we talk about a foundation, we're talking about a foundation of a message, right? We say we examine the foundation. The foundation was laid correctly. So we're not talking about the foundation of an organization, right? We're talking about the foundation of a message, of a movement. Now, now some people can think, you know, in, in these studies, because I've had some feedback, where they think that these, what we're saying, that we're directing it. That is, in people's imaginations, um, they can, they can believe that somebody is thinking this about this person or that person, 
Now, if I'm going to be thinking about a person, I'm going to tell you who I'm thinking about. I'm not going to hint at things. Right? So I just don't do that. I don't give hints and I don't get hints. So, you know, if we're looking at this, we know that there is an opposition to the truth. And that opposition comes in all different kinds of forms. It comes within ourselves, right? It comes within the movement. It comes from outside the movement. And, and we can see that, that there are those that wanted to join in the building of this temple, right? And Zerubbabel, he doesn't have anything to do. You know, he won't have it, right? Now, these people, of course, they come from all of these other areas. They've been brought into the land of Israel, but they're not Jews. They're the Samaritans. Ellen White says they're the Samaritans, right? And they were brought there since the days of Esser Hayden. So that means in that period where Esser Hayden is going to be the king of Assyria and, of course, the king of Babylon, right? So that would be in the time at the end of the 65 years, right? So it's like 677. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily be in that year that they're brought, though that's what some commentators say. They say the 65 years refers to in the days of Esser Hayden, when he brings these people here. But it's just in that time of Esser Hayden. It's in the time when Manasseh is taken captive. But we're saying, what do the, these represent? If, if we're going to apply it to our time, what do these Samaritans represent? We talked about it yesterday. Because what is it that we can't bring into the building of this temple? It was a Protestant understanding of Bible, Bible interpretation. Right. So this is the Protestant understanding of Bible interpretation. That means in order to understand these things, in order to build the temple correctly, the structure, we have to use the tools that God has given us from his word. That is Miller's rules and the expansion of Miller's rules that have unfolded in this movement. So this is not directed at a person or a group of people, correct? So nobody's attacking any person. In my mind, I'm not thinking, oh, this person or that person or this group of people. I'm simply saying that we as a movement need to recognize that if we want to come out of Babylon, we can't be using the Protestant method of Bible study. And we know that the Millerites in their history, even though they professed to use Miller's rules, didn't always use them. And yeah, we know even, that, even, even in this movement, you know. Right. So even in this movement, we have made the same mistakes that the Millerites made. And now we have the opportunity to correct those mistakes. Now, now, I made an assertion because um, I talked to Colin about it um, yesterday. So, you know, there's this assertion that I made that, that Colin made the same mistakes as the Millerites. And, and of course, I've clarified that, that we have made the mistakes. That is, it's not like Colin's fault that he came to the conclusion he did. It's understandable he came to the conclusion that he did regarding Trump because we haven't yet understood how to study that is we have we have brought into our study ideas that are incompatible with our message and we just don't recognize it it doesn't make Colin a bad person or you know Jeff a bad person because he came up with some wrong conclusions or or me a bad person because I've come up with wrong conclusions the fact is we as a movement have all made mistakes. And so we need to correct those mistakes. Now, I believe that what God, God gave, gave Colin, the understanding of, of Daniel chapter three in connection with Daniel verses, uh, chapter 11, verses one to four, and with Revelation 17, 
that that's from God, right? So God gave Colin that, that insight. But the movement has to study these things. That is, in order to come to the correct conclusions, we have to figure out where, where we went wrong. And we know that July 18th, if we don't have a correct understanding of why July 18th didn't work out the way that we expected, then we're going to come to wrong conclusions, right? So we have to learn the lessons of our disappointment. The Millerites didn't in general, the Seventh-day Adventists understood their disappointment. You know, they understood the mistake. They mixed the literal, you know, saying that the earth was the sanctuary, which didn't make mis didn't make sense, right? So that's why they made that mistake. So, so this is what we have here. We're looking at this history, and when we draw this on a line, we should be able to see in our history what this is telling us. So the first thing we see is we know that Cyrus doesn't, you know, he he issues this decree. Right. And then we're getting and he represents Christ. So that's the first message. And then Zerubbabel, when he follows this uh, decree of Cyrus, he's supported by Cyrus. But there is other people who are going to come and want to be involved. And then they're going to basically. Um, it says they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, right? So we got, we know there's Darius the Mede, but now we have Cyrus, king of Persia, all the way to Darius. Now, when we get to verse six, and it says, in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. So many people read this and say, ah, Ahasuerus, that's Xerxes. So they just take that verses, uh, verse four to five, uh, chapter four, verse five. Or you could even start at four, verse four. You're going to say that all of this is just covering from Cyrus to Darius. And then verse six is going to cover, you know, during the reign of Xerxes. And then verse seven is going to be in the reign of Artaxerxes. But we can see as we read through this, but that that's not the case. That the Ahasuerus there is Cambyses and the Artaxerxes in verse seven is false Smyrnus. Okay, so so we're gonna, you know, I mean, I know we're taking our time here, but you can see why I'm doing this, hopefully, why we're going through this in this manner, because we want to get this right, and we won't because it's relating to our time. As Ellen White says, um, the scriptures make special reference, these scriptures, that is the last books of the Old Testament, make special reference to the last days when Bible history will be unfolded. So right now we're seeing the unfolding of Bible history. Um, and that's because uh, these events um, provide guidance for our own course of action in these last days. So if we can't learn from history, uh, we're doomed to repeat it, right? So we, we have to learn from this history so that we're not going to repeat the mistakes of the past. Okay. Now, Ellen White said, and we had read it, um, so the Samaritans tried to hinder their, this work, by false reports, they arouse suspicions in minds easily stirred up to suspect. And because of this discouragement, the Jews became unbelieving and indifferent in regard to the work that the Lord has signified he would have done. So have we had in this movement false reports? Have we participated in false reports? Have we created suspicion regarding others? Have we been suspicious? Uh, yes, I have. Yeah. Okay. So, and and hopefully we've recognized the the error of this. That you know, to be suspicious of our brethren, to listen to false reports, um, and to spread false reports is is destructive. So that 
that has to be repented of if we're going to uh, learn the truth. And it has caused, now you can always say that the person who becomes unbelieving and indifferent, that it's their fault, right? But I, I do think we have an influence and that we can discourage people that if we had acted differently, some people might be in God's kingdom who aren't going to be in it. You know, you, you can't say that we don't have any effect upon on, on the others by our actions and our words. We do. Now, now, when we look at this line then, so when we look at this line, we say, well, these are the three decrees. This represents, you know, the first decree parallels the first angel's message in Millerite history. The second decree parallels the second angel's message in Millerite history. And the third decree parallels the arrival of the third angel in Millerite history, October 22nd, 1844. And then if, if we take these three decrees and we then apply them to our time, we would look at 1989, 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel, and then e either the Sunday law or the close of probation is the arrival of the third, depending on how you understand that. So, so we would have these three decrees parallel our history. But we're saying that we can zoom into this first decree, and this is the decree in where we're going to see this work of the enemies, and we can make this a line in and of itself. That is, we can take these kings uh, that we have here, and and we can take this this history and say, well, this is a line all the way up to you know, either, you know, maybe to the building of the temple. We could take this as a line of the building of the temple. It's going to cover the first and second decree. And, and, and this can be a line in and of itself. I'm not sure how that line is going to be constructed. <clears throat> but that means in this line, we should be able to illustrate our present situation. So I don't know, you know, how this is going to be done, you know, how we're going to do this. But we're not taking this whole line. I mean, we do have a whole line of the three decrees that we can parallel. But we can also zoom into maybe even just the first decree itself and create a line. But but this line of the building of the temple is a line in and of itself. And we should be able to take you know, the death of Cyrus as a waymark in our line. So we have the death of Cyrus. So what would that parallel in our history? I mean, what things could it parallel? Because if, if Cyrus is the first message, and we have his death, what would that parallel? How, how would we take this line and put it in, in our history? Any thoughts on that? What about false murders? I mean, he's going to stop the building of the temple. Does that parallel anything in our history? Dwight, you have thoughts? I was, <clears throat> I appreciate that thought, Brother William. My question is, does false smirtus parallel Parminder and Tess? Right. So, 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 so we could say it does, right? I mean, that's possible. In some line, somewhere, we can see that this, this is a revolt, right? Well, the re we've had the revolts going on for quite a while, but the point was that with Parminder and Tess, that they weren't just revolting, they were attempting to remove 
way marks. Right. So in a similar way, they were stopping the building of the temple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you can see, we can, we, we can look at that. We could say, well, that, that has a parallel, but exactly how to draw that on a line, you know, whether we, we say there's a line of Cyrus and then there's a line of false Smyrtus and there's a line of Darius, right? I mean, you can how, take. Uh, how long did Elder Jeff allow for Parminder to have his influence within this within this movement? Well, I mean, if you look at Parminder was was basically ordained if you go from 2016 to 2019, that was three years. No, he was he was involved much longer though. Not just well, three he, years. Yeah. So I, I think that Parminder sort of came back because I mean, I don't know how much of an influence Parminder had in 2012. I mean, I hadn't met Parminder until 2015. Right. So, you know, and I knew about his his uh, Sunday law prediction for 2014. But I don't know if I would have even, you know, cared about Parminder or anything if you know, until that happened. I mean, that's when you really get, because I knew who his brother was. I didn't really know who Parminder was. I, mean, I, I thought know. Parminder had influence within this movement from about 2011 forward. Well, in 2010, he did the the 20 studies on the 2520. Right. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what he was known for. And he had been in the movement for a long time. But um, 2011, I don't think that, I don't know. I don't know what he was doing in 2011. Well, he definitely wasn't there in 2010 at the Oklahoma no. Prophecy School. Okay. And here's here's why I'm I'm asking the question the way that I am. Okay. Your chart that is is on the screen before us shows mm -hmm. false Smyrtus reign being about seven months, right? Yeah. Now he's killed on the Day of Atonement. Okay. By the way. Well, when I'm looking at the year in which his reign occurred on this chart. 522. If we rearrange the numbers, we have 252. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another symbol of the 2520. Wasn't Parminder talking with Tab in 2012? Parminder. Yeah. Yeah. So in this in this situation, he would be symbolizing his presentations on the 2520 but his presentations are the weak kool-aid because there's just enough error in it that it makes it very palatable but not yeah. poisonous enough to create problems yeah yeah so no, I, yeah okay go on i'm I'm just mentally I'm going back through this because if if Parminder is typifying false Smyrtus, then we could have this seven years that he was directly involved in the movement, giving his presentations and then step by step leading to the open rebellion. Mm -hmm. So because by the time we came to this with the meetings in Germany, it was almost as if he had been anointed to lead. Mm 
even though he shouldn't have been. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, obviously we can look at false murders as relating to Parminder's message. But but I think this revolt here would, wouldn't be so much, you know, the whole period of time of Parminder. I mean, I think it would refer to um, the actual revolt, which, you know, I put at, you know, August 29th, 2019. It's going to be that camp meeting anyway in, in Germany. Um, but yeah, so you can see though we have lots of, of events that can parallel things in our history. The question is, how do we put these on a line? Right, because, you know, we're going to have the death of Cyrus, you're going to have Cambyses, Cambyses, you know, um, he's going to be murdered by false murders after false murders revolts, right? And then, um, and then he's going to be killed on September 29th, 522 BC, which on the Babylonian calendar is the 10th day of the seventh month, right? So that's going to be symbolically the day of atonement. Now, you know, if I have the biblical calendar correct in that year, it's, it's different, but the Babylonian calendar would be the September 29th. So it's the 10th day of the seventh month that he's killed, which I think is, is rather interesting. It's, it's also on the Gregorian September 23rd, um, which is also a date that we've recognized. So on, on the biblical calendar, it's the ninth day of the sixth month, but on the Babylonian, it's the tenth day of the seventh month. <clears throat> okay. So so anyway, we have a lot of detail that we're going to have to work through to understand that history. But right now, we're we're still kind of skimming over it. So Ellen White says. Um, they were opposed by Smyrtus, the usurper, then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now, so the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So I'm going to just, um, that's what the Bible says. And um, so I have to. Find this. So here's this other chart right there, the building of the second temple. So uh, we're going to go about We're going to look at this in more detail later, but I just want to note. So we got Darius reign begins September 29th, 522 BC. So that's the 10th day of the seventh month on the biblical or on the Babylonian calendar. If you look at the calendar for converter, you'll see that. Now, so the second year is going to be the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah, right? So you can see here on the bottom, the rain is from spring to spring. So in 522, this is the accession year of Darius. So his first year does not begin until the spring of 521. Okay, does that make sense to people? You can see he... Ex Succeeds to the throne on September 29th, 522. But the first year of his reign is in the spring of 521. And then his second year is going to be in the spring of 520. And Haggai is going to be the first one that begins to prophesy. So it, it's going to be in the sixth month uh, that he's going to begin prophesying. In the second year of Darius, that's what that 612 is. So it's Haggai 1.1. 1, 1. And in Haggai 1.15, uh, it's going to give a specific date, the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius. And it's got the dates there, you know, 829, 520, 921, 520. Those are our calendar dates. <clears throat> and then Zechariah is going to begin prophesying in the eighth month, right? So we don't know what date. It's just he's going to prophesy in the eighth month of the second year 
of Darius. So that's going to be, Haggai's already going to have three different prophecies before Zechariah prophesies. And, and after Zechariah's first prophecy, we're going to have Haggai doing his last prophecy in September 24th in the second year of Darius. So all of Haggai's prophesying is in the second year of Darius. So we know under the prophesying of Haggai, they're going to resume the building, right? They're going to start rebuilding the temple. And in Zechariah 1 verse 7 um, and 7 1, uh, we have two dates. Now we also know in, in chapter 7, um, that's going to be uh, the fourth day of the ninth month in the fourth year. That's going to be Zechariah's last dated vision, I believe. And uh, that's the one where he talks in both of these, Zechariah 1, 7 and 7, 1. He's going in these chapters, chapter 1 and chapter 7. He's going to talk about this the 70 year period. Right. So that 70 year period is not going to end until 516. And that's in the sixth year of Darius. And that's when the temple is going to be completed. So we will look at all that. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is that we have, according to the spirit of prophecy uh, statement, where she's going to apply. Um, they were opposed by Smyrtus, the usurper. And then the work of the house ceased until the second year of Darius. So it's going to be in 520, maybe in five, early 519, that we're going to have then the Jews commence rebuilding the temple. Right? So after Haggai and Zechariah begin their prophesying, they're then going to start rebuilding the temple. So, so we have this history of the building of the temple, and it's going to be completed and it's going to be dedicated. So we're, we're going to look at that as well. Okay, so let's look at some of the specific things that are said regarding these enemies. So we know about false murders, um, but let's but let's look here um, at Ahasuerus. In the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they, that is, these people, these counselors that were hired to frustrate the perp their purpose in building the temple, they wrote unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. So in the time of Cambyses, there's going to be this accusation. It doesn't tell us anything here beyond that, right? Just that the Samaritans were continuing in this period um, to do that. Now I'm going to uh, go to another spirit of prophecy statement. So this is in Prophets and Kings. Stay in a sec. Okay, so. Sorry, it's taking a bit of time here. Okay, so it says here. Uh, during the reign of Cambyses, the work of the, on the temple progressed slowly. And during the reign of false Smyrtus, called Artaxerxes in Ezra 4, verse 7, the Samaritans induced the unscrupulous imposter to issue a decree forbidding the Jews to rebuild their temple and city. So she's showing that this is during the reign of Cambyses, right? And then false Smyrtus who's referred to as Artaxerxes. She says, for over a year, the temple was neglected and well nigh forsaken. The people dwelt in their homes and strove to attain temporal prosperity, but their situation was deplorable. Work as they might, they did not prosper. The very elements of nature seemed to conspire against them because they had let the temple lie waste. The Lord sent upon their substance a wasting drought. God had bestowed upon them the fruits of field and garden, the corn and the wine and the oil as token of his favor. But because they had used these bountiful gifts so selfishly, the blessings were removed. 
Such were the conditions existing during the early part of the reign of Darius Histaspes. Right, so that's Darius the Great, right? That's Darius the Persian. Spiritually as well as temporally, the Israelites um, were in a pitiable state, pitiable state. So long had they murmured and doubted. So long had they chosen to make personal interests first while viewing with apathy the Lord's temple in ruins, that many had lost sight of God's purpose in restoring them to Judea. And these were saying, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. So that's Haggai 1 verse 2. But even this dark hour was not without hope for those who, whose trust was in God. The prophets Haggai and Zechariah were raised up to meet the crisis. In stirring testimonies, these appointed messengers revealed to the people the cause of their troubles. The lack of temporal prosperity was the result of a neglect to put God's interests first. And the prophets declared, the prophets declared, had the Israelites honored God, had they shown him due respect and courtesy by making the building of his house their first work, they would have invited his presence and blessing. Okay, so if we were to put this on a line, uh, what does this parallel in our history? I don't know, maybe, maybe the present present movement. Okay, so so we can make a, we can make a parallel to the present movement, and we can make a parallel to our own lives as well, right? Yeah, right. So, so we can all say, you know, that we have put other interests first rather than the kingdom of God. So you can see that you can take this this testimony, the spirit of prophecy. And you could place it at different levels, different zooms, right? I mean, we could we could apply this to the Adventist Church in in Ellen White's day. Actually, a lot of people see in uh, the book uh, uh, "Patriarchs and Prophets" and "Prophets and Kings." This is actually uh, uh, "Prophets and Kings." I said it's "Patriarchs and Prophets," but this is "Prophets and Kings," and and many people can see Ellen White making inference to the present situation in Adventism at that time. That is, she's taking these stories about what happened in the Old Testament with the prophets and the kings, and she's making application to her time. And, and I think that's a very valid way to look at what she's doing in, in these articles, because Prophets and Kings was put together after her death published after her death, though a lot of the work was already done before. And she definitely wrote all of these articles and they were edited then to put into the books Prophets and Kings. Um, but this this is stuff that she wrote, right? And so we can take this and we can say, you know, Ellen White is seeing what's happening then. But we should be able to make an application to our own time. So whether we do it on a bigger level, dealing with um, uh, the church even in, in the present day, or we apply it to this movement, or we apply it to our personal lives, those are all valid applications. Now, what we want to do ultimately is, see, we have this line that, that we're going to eventually be addressing, right? So we know that we have taken this and we've applied it in this way. We've taken Darius the Mede, we lined up with Reagan, and then we have these count of the seven kings of Persia, Cyrus, Cambyses, False Murders, Darius the First, Xerxes, also called the Hazareris, Artabanus, which some dispute whether he's actually a king of Persia, and then Artaxerxes uh, the second, right? Artaxerxes Longimanus, right? So that's going to be, and we have these dates of these decrees. 457, 516, here I put 537, but the decree itself is in 536. And then we've lined up these kings here of the United States, and, you know, we just line them up to Xerxes. Now then, some people say, well, we'd have to put in here uh, Biden, and then we put Trump again, right? So that's kind of what Colin did, you know, roughly speaking. Um 
you know, so Artabanus, you know, would probably fit well with Biden in that, you know, Artabanus is, is hardly recognized as a king of Persia. Uh, definitely Biden is not the president of the United States. So, you know, so people can make a case for that. So however people want to do this, this is something that we, we have to address in the future. Now the question is, is this application correct? Is Jeff correct in doing this? But is it the application that we should be looking at? That is, is this is because we could say that this is a correct application, you know, because we used it to predict something. And, and that thing that we predicted came to pass. But in the story of Xerxes, we know that in the line of the decrees, this is still in the second decree, right? That the third decree is here. So if we were going to take this and, and label this, you know, this would be the arrival of the first message. This would be its formalization and empowerment. Right. So Cambyses and Clinton would be the formalization of a message. False Murtis and Bush would be the empowerment, Bush too. And then Obama would be the arrival of the second message lined up with Darius the first. And then Xerxes would be Trump, and that would be the formalization of the second message. And then Biden would be the empowerment if we're going to put Biden here. And then Trump again would be the third decree, Arctic Xerxes. That would be, you know. The arrival of the third message. Now, I'm not saying that we, we would do that, but I'm just saying if we took these seven and line them up as way marks, we would have to, we could make that case. I mean, I think we would have to make that case, but, you know, some people would just say, well, we could make that case, right? So at the very least, we could make the case that we could create this as a line. But is that line meaningful for the present time? That is, you know, is is that really the line that we want to have? If we have that line, we need to know where that line fits, what it is, because it would be not the main line. It would be a zoom in. That is, we're not going to put, uh, for instance, Obama at 9-11 as the arrival of the second main angel's message, because that's going to be Bush the second that's there at 9-11, um, right? You understand what I'm saying? Correct. Yeah. So, so in, in trying to create these lines, I, I don't think that we really knew what we were doing. It doesn't mean that God wasn't leading us or that we were wrong in, in sort of the ultimate sense. Light was just unfolding to us and we didn't understand the lines at the time. And I don't think we do still understand them fully, right? Cause that's what we're trying to sort out. Um, but if I was going to continue this and put Biden and Trump here, I would have to have a rationale for this whole line and explain how, how it works. And I'd have to know what this line is within all of the other lines that we have. I would have to say, you know, this is a zoom into whatever way mark on some other line. But I don't think that I could argue that this is the main line, that we could take these and we can say this is from 1989 to the Sunday law, because in a sense, that's kind of kind of what we're saying about this line. It's 9-11 to the Sunday law. Now, Jeff wasn't doing that, right? He wasn't taking this. He was just going up to Xerxes, Right. He was just going up to Xerxes. Trump's going to bring in the Sunday law. The history of Xerxes is a type of the Sunday law. And, and so that's something that we still have to address. How do we address Xerxes? Do we see this as uh, something similar to the pandemic as far as the type of the Sunday law? Is this just typical of what's going to happen? And then if we take Artaxerxes as the arrival of the third message, well, how does this relate to the Sunday law history? So, so we still haven't addressed those problems. So you can see that we have a lot to unravel. 
Okay. So now when we go back then to Ezra, so we keep jumping ahead here, but there's a reason for doing that to understand how we make an application. So we have this history in the reign of Cambyses that there's going to be this opposition. So, so we'd have to make an application. We'd have to say, well, where are we going to put Cambyses? Where is this opposition? How do we put this on the line? And then in the days of Artaxerxes, so we're going to say that's that's false murders, according to the spirit of prophecy. Now we have these people, uh, Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabil, and the rest of their companions unto Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the writing of the letter was written in the Syrian tongue uh, and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. So these guys are going to write to Artaxerxes. Now, is it important, uh, the names of these people that are in the Bible here? I mean, we don't know anything else about them. So why are these names given to us? No, some, so we can look at the meaning of the names, right? Um, so Bishlam, no. Now, one of the things about these, these names, these are Samaritans, right? Um, but these names are, are, are related to Hebrew names, right? So we can look at the Hebrew of them. Now, Bishlam, you can see the word uh, Shalom, which means peace. And the Bet in the front just means in peace, right? So that's how they're interpreting this name, Bishlam. So Bishlam uh, means in peace, Bashalom. Okay. Then we have Mithridath. Now, his name means given by Mithra. So who's Mithra? Now, these are of Persian or origins. So these are Persian names, but who's Mithra? Anybody know what Mithraism is? I was the uh, religion of the Persians. Yeah, it's the Persian religion. Okay. So um, now he's, um, and I'm just looking here on Wikipedia, but he's, uh, they say an ancient Iranian deity. So that would be Persian deity of covenants, light, oath, justice, the sun, contracts, and friendship. In addition to being the divinity of contracts, Mithra is also a judicial figure, an all-seeing protector of truth, the guardian of cattle, the harvest, and the waters. Right? So we know that Persian religion is Zoroastrianism. So that's um, so the, the idea of Mithra relates to that religion. There's not a lot of Zoroastrians. Um, Presently on Earth, people worshiping that religion. Um, you have sort of neo Zoroastrianism, which is kind of made up. But um, so, so this character here, given by Mithra, uh, so Mithra doth that doth there it refers to um, a gift, right? So given of Mithra. Now we have uh, the number 4990, that's the Hebrew number two, which we can look at. And then uh, Tabiel, right? Tabiel. God is good. Um, so you got that Tab, that's like Tov, that means good. Um, so, so their names are all good, you know, in peace. Well, maybe the Mithra, Mithra thing isn't, but, you know, it's given of God if you're going to say Mithra represents God, and then God is good. So they're going to bring these accusations, right? 
Now, what they write is, um, now, Riam the Chancellor and Shimshai the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes the king in this sort. So you have this guy, Rehum, another guy, uh, the name of a Persian, right? His name means compassion. And uh, he's a chancellor. So that word chancellor is um, uh, like a leader, uh, a judge. He's a type of judge. And then Shimshai, um, which means it, it's related to Samson. Shimshan, Shimshai, it means sunny. Or Samson means sunlight. Um, and the scribe, so Shimshai the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes king in this sort. So Artaxerxes here is false smurtis, right? Now, um, the Hebrew here is Artaxashd, right? So ended up as Artaxerxes sort of through uh, transliterations into different languages. Um, in this sort, so this word, um, in this manner. Then wrote Riam the Chancellor and Shimshai the Scribe, the rest of their companions, uh, the Dinaites, the Afarsakites, the Tarpolites, the Afarsites, the Arch Archivites, the Babylonians, the Susan, so that's Shushan, right? Shushan Ki, that is, those that live in some unknown place in Assyria, the Davahites and the Elamites. So we got um, Dinites, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And, and the rest of the nations anyway, whom the great and noble a snapper brought over and set in the cities of Samaria. Uh, so this is an Assyrian king, a snapper. Some people say Ashurbanipal. Now, anybody know who Ashurbanipal is? Was father an Assyrian king? Yeah, he's an Assyrian king. So when does he come in the line of these Assyrian kings? Is he not quite early, around 800s BC? Um, so so he's he's the one that followed SR Hayden. Okay. okay so so he's, 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 he's He's the successor of S.R. Hayden. So we have S.R. Hayden being mentioned. Uh, but after S.R. Hayden, we're also still going to have um, people being brought into northern Israel. So S.R. Hayden is the one who began bringing people from these other countries to populate northern Israel. Uh, but his son, Asher Banipal, if that's who it is, which I think it is. Um, he also does the same thing. So that's why he's mentioned. Okay. So we have Asher Banipal. Um, so they're going they're not going to mention Esar Hayden here in their letter. They're going to mention his his descendant, Asher Banipal. Okay. So that's the son of Esar Hayden. One of the sons. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, one of the other sons is going to be, become the king of Babylon. <clears throat> so, so Babylon, after the death, death of Esar Hayden, Assyria and Babylon are no longer united. Uh, they're going to be at war with each other. And, and that war is going to go on until Assyria is finally defeated by Babylon. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to finish there. So we're going to come back and take this up tomorrow. We're going to start looking at at this history. Now, I don't know when we're going to get this drawn on a line, but we're going to try to start that uh, this week. We're going to start drawing lines and try to figure out how we can sort through these things. Okay, so uh, let's close with prayer.
Dear Father in heaven, we just ask for your spirit to continue to be with us throughout this day. Help us in all that we do. Thank you for the study this morning and for each person. Help our words, Lord, to be understood by those who watch these videos. May your spirit work upon our hearts in bringing a conviction and a power to our lives. Be with each person in their trials and bring us together again to study thy word according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.